It is my privilege to introduce as our speaker for this hour, my good friend and brother in Christ, Brother Johnny Skaggs. Brother Johnny was born in Albuquerque, New Mexico, but at the age of seven, his parents moved with the rest of the family to a farm in northeast of West Plains, Missouri. He got a pretty good education working with his dad, I assume, as they worked in the woods together until he was at the age of 15 when he began to learn the trade of being an uh, auto body uh, repair or work. And I know that that can be uh, hard work. I used to sell products to the body shops years ago, you know, rechrome bumpers and bundo and things of that nature. But anyway, Johnny preached his first sermon at the age of 14 in Winona, Missouri. He continued doing body work, however, until 1981, which he decided to become a gospel preacher, and we're certainly glad that he did. Back in June of 1976, he married Nancy Jean Thoroughborough. Uh, Thornborough, you have to pronounce her name for me. Ask her. <laughs> Ask her. <laughs> he doesn't know either. <laughs> Thorn. Thornbrew. Brew. All right. I didn't know how you pronounce Thornbrew. Of Stratford, Missouri. They've been married for 40 years and they've been blessed with four children. Two of his sons have come through the school of preaching. Brother Jared is here and I think Brother Stephen is here as well. Maybe the other children are here as well. I told Brother Jared he looked a lot like his father. I said, so much so, if he claims you're adopted, well then he was adopted also. Because <laughs> they look so much alike. He attended the 8th and Lee School of Biblical Studies in Lawton, Oklahoma. He's also a graduate of Southwest School of Biblical Studies in Austin, Texas. He's done local work in Oklahoma, Arkansas, Missouri, Florida, and Georgia, and currently preaches for the Bellevue Church of Christ in Dublin, Georgia. The students uh, a couple of years back went on a campaign down there, and I was privileged to be there with them in that. He's taught courses at the Curry Street School of Biblical Studies in West Plain, Missouri. Taught extension courses for the Florida School of Preaching, which is located in La uh, Lakeland, Florida. He currently teaches for the Georgia School of Preaching and the extension work, which, which he's located in Warner Robins, Georgia. He has written several tracks, five books. He's been the editor of 12 books, so he does a lot of printing. Also, he is the editor owner, uh, I guess you would say, of the uh, Gospel Journal, and he holds meetings throughout many states and does lectureships throughout radio program and on and on we could go talking about that, but he has a more important topic of which to speak this morning, and that is eternal life as seen in the book of 1 John, and we look forward to that because we're all concerned with eternal life, and we're glad that Brother John is here to tell us about it. Thank you, Brother Billy. You gotta love Billy Bland, don't you? He is a special person, and I appreciate him so very much and all the good work he does, along with others here at the Memphis School of Preaching, all the good work they do, and, and everybody who's involved in the, in the school. You know, we often think about the teachers, but I know there are many others who are involved, the secretaries and, and everyone else, the uh, librarians, and of course the elders as they oversee this work and uh, by the very as he preaches here and all the things they all do together. And I'm so thankful that the Lord has blessed them and that they're able to continue uh, with the school here and the great work they're doing. Especially blessed that uh, two of my boys uh, got to go through the school and they're now preaching and bringing glory to God and uh, what a great blessing that is. And uh, I'm sorry that I marked Jared so badly, but you know, that's how it is. I didn't realize how much we looked alike uh, as each other, but uh, about a year ago, I guess it was, maybe two years, time gets by quickly, doesn't it? But uh, I was at the Get Well Lectureship, and some young boy come up behind me and slapped me on the shoulder. He said, Skaggs! And I turned around, he said, oh, sorry, Brother Skaggs, I thought you was Jared. <laughs> and I thought, I know, I look awful young, but you know. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I'm very thankful for my children. They, I tell you what, 
when you have children who are preaching and they call you from time to time, it is a great encouragement. And uh, I hope I encourage them, but, but they encourage me more than I encourage them. And I'm so thankful for that. I know that others who have sons who are preachers feel the same way as I do. Uh, let me say just a little bit about the Gospel Journal. If you're not receiving the Gospel Journal, I hope and pray that you'll go over to the uh, bookstore room and uh, sign up for the journal. Uh, it's still being uh, produced, and we're working hard to uh, put out a good, sound gospel uh, paper uh, that does some good in our brotherhood. Uh, also, I brought with me uh, volumes 2002 through 2008, and uh, we have an overabundance of those. And I have uh, discounted those to $5 each. So you can buy 2002 through 2008 for $5 a piece. I think I brought eight uh, sets with me, and I do not want to take them back. So please come over and look at those. And also, of course, the 2013 and 2014 uh, bound volumes over there, they're $20 each. Uh, and don't wait for them to be $5 each, because they won't be. <laughs> There's not that many of them. But, uh, but anyway, if you can take a look at those and sign up for the journal if you're not getting it, we sure appreciate your support and help and anything you can do to encourage us and, uh, and help us, we most certainly appreciate that. Eternal life. That's a vast subject, isn't it? We're going to be looking primarily this morning at uh, 1 John and several different verses in 1 John. You might want to be turning there as we think about 1 John and eternal life. When I think about eternal life, it is difficult for me to really understand what eternal life means. I know I can say it's eternal. I can say it's everlasting. But even that is a concept that I really can't understand. I mean, I can go back and look and say, well, I know what it means to be 20 years old. I know what it means to be 30 or 40. I know what it means to be 50. I even know what it means to be 60, believe it or not. I'm about to know what it means to be 62. And I hope and play I can know what it means to be 70, perhaps 80, maybe 90, and a little bit beyond that if the Lord wills. I can say I know what it feels to be like those particular ages because I have experienced those or in hopes to experience those. So I can look at that in time and say, well, I know what it means to be 40 years old. I've been there. I've done that, see. I can relate to that. But when you think about eternity, I cannot relate to eternity. Everlasting, never ending, eternal life. That's beyond my grip. But at the same time, I understand that it is a promise from God that he will fulfill. And so we have hope of eternal life. In 1 John chapter 1, or excuse me, 1 John chapter 5, John says this here in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. John says, these things have I written to you that you may know. The word know occurs 39 times in this short book of 1 John. That ought to tell us something, hadn't it? That ought to relate to you and I that uh, John is trying to get across to us that there is the ability here to know that we have certain things. In this case here, the ability to know that we have eternal life. I believe this. That when one leaves this world, and we're all going to leave this world at some time, life is short, isn't it? Eternity is forever. All of us are going to leave this world at some time, and I believe this, that when I die, when I leave this world, I can know with an absolute knowledge if heaven is going to be my home. Now, I stress that because at one time, I, I was preaching that several years ago, probably back uh, 20 years ago, perhaps, and I made that statement, and an elder came up to me later and said, John, you cannot say that. I said, say what? 
He said, you cannot say that you can have an absolute knowledge that when you die, you're going to go to heaven. I said, well, why not? He said, none of us can have absolute knowledge about anything. And I said, well, do you know you're here? He said, yeah. I said, are you absolutely sure you're here? He said, well, of course. I said, well, that's absolute knowledge, right? Yeah, he said, but that's different. No, it's not any different. God assures us through the Apostle John, to the writers of John, that we can know absolutely that we have eternal life. And so you and I need to be aware of that. We don't need to wander through life wondering, will I make it to heaven or not? I, I would hate to go to my deathbed wondering where am I going to be at in eternity, not knowing. And John assures us we can have that knowledge. Humanity needs answers to what happens after life, don't they? And John gives us those answers. Four times in this short but powerful book, John calls our attention to the phrase eternal life as it relates to our eternal life. And then in 1 John 4, 17, he refers to the day of judgment, which also refers to the concept of eternal life. God will give us eternal life. However, eternal life is predicated upon certain things. There are some things you and I are going to have to do, first of all, and some things you and I are going to have to continue doing in order to maintain the eternal life that God has promised us. And I want to look at those things with you this morning in the time that we have allotted. Number one is this. Eternal life is tied to our belief in the name of Jesus Christ. Do you believe in the name of Jesus Christ? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? If not, you cannot have eternal life. But those who believe in the name of Jesus Christ, they can have eternal life. Look back at the text we just read in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. John says, I'm writing to those of you who believe on the name of the Son of God. It's written for us, isn't it? John says, I'm writing these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, you see. These verses remind us of what John wrote in the Gospel of John, John chapter 20, verse 30, 31. You remember that John uh, there wrote uh, uh, many other signs truly to Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe, and that believing you may have eternal life, everlasting life. John says these things are written to give you the evidence, right? That when you read these things, you can see, right? And John here in this text here in 1 John 5, 13 says the very same thing. These things are written to give you evidence that you may be able to believe. And uh, the, one of the evidence is this. If we believe in the name of Jesus Christ, we have eternal life. Just as we can see the thing that Jesus did while living on earth, which causes us to believe him, that is the signs and miracles of that, things of that nature, when you read 1 John, it ought to bring light to you to understand that you can have eternal life. And so we must believe in Jesus, mustn't we? Let's go back and read a few verses earlier. 1 John 5, beginning verse 10. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath not life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe in the name of the Son of God. Now when we talk about believing... In the name of the Son of God, the believing in Christ, and that being tied to our eternal life, we're not talking about just a mental ascent to say, I believe in Jesus, right? What we're talking about here is a life that is dedicated based upon your belief in Jesus that you're going to serve the Lord. That's the concept there. When one says, I believe in Jesus Christ, they're saying that I'm going to do what Christ enjoins upon me to do. And because of that, 
you and I can be assured that we have eternal life. And so that's the first point that I believe John makes, or at least that's how I'm outlining it. Secondly is this, eternal life is tied to walking in the light. Eternal life is tied to walking in the light. If one is going to enjoy eternal life, then he or she must continually walk in the light. And if one doesn't continue to walk in light, then one cannot have eternal life. It's really that simple, isn't it? Sometimes we try to get things so complicated, don't we? When really when you break it down to the basics, it's just as so simple as saying that if you walk in the light, you have eternal life. If you don't walk in light, you don't have eternal life. And isn't that what John was writing about? In 1 John chapter 1, you recall, as John writes these words in, uh, in verse 7, But if we walk in the light as he is in light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. You and I recognize that he is saying there, as we walk in light, as he is in light, that we're talking about this idea of continually walking, right? You see, the idea is this here. There was one time that you and I, we walked hand in hand with the devil, didn't we? Now, no one may want to admit that. No one may want to say, well, I, I walked the devil one time. But the fact of the matter is, all of us did at one time, didn't we? Before I become a child of God, before I become a Christian, I walked hand in hand with the devil. But on becoming a child of God, I stopped walking hand in hand with the devil, and I began walking hand in hand with the Lord. Walking in the light as He is in the light, you see. Peter says that we once were in darkness, but now we're in light, right? According to uh, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, where he says, You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praise of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. At one time I was in darkness, but the Lord called me out of that darkness into his marvelous light, and as long as I keep on walking in that light, I keep on having eternal life. But when I stop walking in that light, then I cease from having eternal life. So how can I know? Well, here's how you know. It's by the life you live, isn't it? And the Lord wasn't saying, you know, I want you to, to walk in such a way that you're so perfect that you don't even squeak when you walk, you know. He wasn't saying that, was he? The Lord recognizes that we are, we're all human. We have our, our shortcomings. Every one of us have shortcomings, don't we? I'm not perfect by no means. And uh, if anybody thinks I am, just ask my wife and she'll tell you real quick that I'm not, you know. Quicker than I like for sometimes too, you know. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, we're, we're, we're all striving to do better, aren't we? The one thing about it is, is this here, that when we realize we've done wrong... We ask God's forgiveness, and that's when we pick ourselves back up and begin walking back in the light, right? I'm so thankful that I don't have to be baptized every time I mess up, aren't you? Aren't you glad of that? So I like the priests of old, the, 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 the children of Israel, back in the, in the uh, Israel day, days of Israel. Every year they had to make that sacrifice over and over. Aren't you glad you don't live under that law? I live under a new law now where I was baptized uh, at a young age, come in contact with the blood of Christ. He cleansed me from all my sins. And from that moment on, instead of having to be baptized over and over and over when I commit a sin, I just had to repent of my sins. Ask the Lord to forgive me of my sins. When those things were of a public nature, I asked publicly. When they were private nature, I asked privately. I wake up every morning and I suspect you do too, asking God to forgive me for my sins. I go to bed every night, and I suspect you do as well, asking God to forgive me for my sins. And often through the day, I say, Lord, forgive me. That's not a mission that I sin every day, but it's just a concept that I want to make sure that I'm right with God. That I keep on walking in the light. And I keep striving to do what God would have me to do. Because here's what I want. I want eternal life. When I leave this world, I want to be 
with God forever. I want to be with my Lord forever. I want to be with the host of those who have gone on before us forever. I look forward to that, don't you? You know, yesterday we were hearing some lessons on eternal life and fellowship and the joy of being in heaven. I can't imagine being in heaven without you all. I can't imagine that. There are so many here that I have known for years. Some are new acquaintances. But can you imagine being in heaven without each other? No, what a great day that'll be to be in heaven, won't it? Eternal life, what a great concept. And if we keep on walking in light as he is in light, the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, keeps on cleansing us from all of our sins. And that brings me to my third point. And that is the eternal life is tied to the blood of Jesus Christ. Tied to the blood of Jesus Christ. Look back at that verse once again, verse 7 of 1 John chapter 1. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, listen to what it says. We have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sins. Just as my walking in the light is continuous action, the blood of Jesus Christ cleansing me from my sin is also continuous action. As long as I keep on walking in the light, his blood keeps on cleansing me from all my sins. You know, today we have in our world, and Brother Wesley touched on some of these things earlier, about those who believe that, uh, that you're saved prior to baptism and that you don't need to be baptized. Uh, you know, you're either an elect or the non-elect. And I've often thought about this. How is it they think you can be saved without the blood of Christ? You ever thought about that? Now, you know, when they, when, they, when they make those statements, you know, that you're saved prior to being baptized, what they're really saying, they may not recognize this. They may not fully understand what they're saying, but you and I need to understand it. What they're really saying is that they can be saved without the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And if they can do that, then why did Christ die? There's no reason for him to die, right, if you can be saved without his blood. And that's exactly what they teach. Though, as, as I said, they would not admit that. Our Lord gave his blood on Calvary for the sins of humanity. In uh, Matthew 26, 28, For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. The Hebrew writer said in Hebrews chapter 9, 22, That without the shedding of the blood, there is no remission of sins. One cannot have remission of sins, that is, without coming into contact with the blood of Jesus Christ. How does one come in contact with the blood of Christ? It is through baptism. When we are baptized in the body of Jesus Christ, we come in contact with the blood of Jesus Christ. Romans 6, verse 3, And know you not that so many of us are baptized into Jesus Christ, we're baptized into his death. There's where we come in contact with the blood, right? To back it up, watch this here. Acts 22, verse 16. Uh, Ananias told uh, Paul, Saul that is, and Paul later, Why tarest thou now? Arise and be baptized, washing away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Acts 22, verse 16. Now, check this out. Revelation 1, verse 5, as you put these together. John says this here. From Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince, the kings of earth, unto him that loved us and watched, washed us from our sins in his own blood. Now, John says in Revelation that Jesus Christ washed us. Now, I know y'all say that word washed different, but that's all right. Uh, you can get corrected later, you know. But he washed us in his own blood, right? And Ananias told Saul, rise up and be baptized, washing away your sins. That's where it's at, you know. And uh, I tell you what, you can search the Bible all over and you won't find a different answer. That's what the Bible teaches. And you're not even to recognize how important that is that we understand that uh, we come in contact with the blood in baptism. I tell you what, I, I've, I'm having people say today, and things like, you know, well, if they're on the way to be baptized and they die before they're baptized, 
Uh, you know, the Lord is, don't you know the Lord is going to save them, John? I said, I don't know any such thing. Now, I'm not being judgmental, but I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Unless you come in contact with the blood of Christ, there is no remission of sins. It's not that you think you're going to, or you hope you're going to, or you intend to. It's that you did, right? That happens in baptism. And so when one rises up out of that water grave, one rises up to walk in a newness of life, according to Romans chapter uh, uh, 6. That's where we're at, isn't it? And that's how we need to be. And then, having become a Christian, we have access to that beautiful blood of Jesus Christ constantly. Isn't that great? You know, uh, I, I used to, when I uh, lived back in Missouri, I'd go down to Arkansas every now and then, Mammoth Springs, and I'd, I'd get in those, uh, those spring waters, you know, and, uh, and do a little trout fishing. And, and you walk in the, in the spring water, and as you walk in the water, you're, you're constantly in the water fishing, right? You see? And as long as I'm in that water, I understand what it means to be in the water, don't you? When I get out of the water, I understand I'm not long, no longer in the water. I'm on the bank now, on dry land. And I've always thought about this idea that this is exactly what John's talking about. As long as I'm walking in that blood, keeping in that blood, I'm in the river of the blood of Jesus Christ, as it were. As long as I keep on walking in it, I keep on being cleansed from all my sins. If I get out of it, I'm on dry land. And there's no blood on dry land. It's only by walking in the blood that we have our sins cleansed constantly and continually. And so we need to remember that eternal life is tied to the blood of Jesus Christ. And then fourthly, the eternal life is tied to our love for each other. I cannot overestimate and overstate the importance of love for each other. Brethren, we need to show love one for another. And I'm afraid in so many places it is lacking. And because of that, we're not growing as we ought to grow. Paul said this here in Galatians 5, verse 13. For brethren, you are called unto liberty. Only use not your liberty, says, for occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Hebrews 13, verse 1, the Hebrew writer said, let brotherly love continue. You know, the Hebrew writer just assumes it's already there, right? He doesn't say let it begin, let it start. He says let it continue. You know, I need to recognize as we become children of God that we are to love one another and grow in that love to each other. Continue in love. And by that, all men will know that we are disciples of Christ, of course. The love we should have towards our brothers and sisters is essential to our eternal life. Without it, we will not be with our Father who abides in heaven. Listen, you cannot hate the brethren and have eternal life. If you want eternal life, you're going to have to love the brethren. The love under consideration here is that for which our brother in Christ should have one for another. And where it does not exist, there is the absence of divine parenthood. Do you understand that? If you do not love each other, then you cannot love God. And there's the absence there of that divine parenthood. I need God as my father, don't you? And I need you as my brothers and sisters in Christ. And Lord Jesus Christ being our other brother. John will later say this here. 1 John chapter 2 verse 15. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And he says, you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Now John equates this. The concept of not loving your brother. And that's what that means to he that hates his brother. The meaning is, is to not love your brother. One who does not love his brother as he ought to, the Bible says, John says, he is likened unto a murderer. Now, none of us would want to be called a murderer, right? But John says that's exactly what we're likened unto. And then he adds this here, and you know that no murderer has any part in eternal life. 
Therefore, he that does not love his brother has no part in eternal life. Wouldn't you hate to be the one who all your life attended services Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and, uh, and did other things, but yet held that grudge against your brother and, uh, and showed that you didn't love your brother and stand before God in the day of judgment and hear these words, depart from me, I never knew you. And he says, here's why. Because you hated your brother. What a great shame, right? What a great shame. I know that we all deal with different situations at different times in our life. And sometimes those situations can be very difficult, right? Sometimes they can make you, make you sour. Sometimes they can make you very upset. But you've got to push through those things, don't you? And you've got to realize this here, that we're here to bring glory to God, right? And, uh, and, and, and live our lives in such a way that does bring glory to God. And love the brethren as we ought to. Love the brethren is one of the keys to obeying the commandments of God. In Mark chapter 12, verse 29 through 31, Jesus answered the scribes, and uh, said that thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. He says this is the first commandment. And the second is like unto it, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is no other commandment greater than these, Jesus so said. John says this here in 1 John 3 verse 14. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. That is, does not have eternal life. And so if one hates his brother, that is, if he does not love him, then he abides in death, or he is spiritually dead to God. He continues on by saying this here in verse 15, uh, 1 John 3, 15. Whosoever hath his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer hath eternal life, abide in him. And so he places in that one in that same category. 1 John 3, verse 16, notice what he says in this text. Hereby perceive we, perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we are to lay down our lives for the brethren. If you love your brother, you'll be willing to lay down your life for your brother. That might be a test of all of us, mightn't it? You might ask yourself this. Would I lay down my life for my brother or sister in Christ? Would I be willing to give up my life for my brother and sister in Christ? Now, if you ask me if I'd be willing to get my life up for my wife, I would happily say yes. Or for my children, with the exception of Jared, I would happily say yes. <laughs> no, Jared, I'd do that for you too, son. At least you'd be left behind, see, and look like me. That'd carry on that way. <laughs> now, we would give up our life for our children, right? Who wouldn't, right? I mean, you know, I'm, I'm about to be 62, and I've lived a good life. I'm, I'm, I'm content to go on and be with the Lord if the Lord wants me to go with Him. And if I need to give up that my life for my children, I would gladly do it. You know, show you how dedicated my wife is. Uh, one of our kids was needing some, uh, some help one time. And it was going to cost us quite a bit. And she said, well, I'm just going to sell a kidney. You know, she tried to get me to sell my boats. I said, no, I'm not doing that, you know. <laughs> but she said, well, I'll just sell a kidney. And then she found out it was illegal. She couldn't do it. <laughs> but the Lord blessed us anyway, and we had the money. But, uh, but that shows you the kind of dedication she has, that she'd give up her own body parts to help one of our children, see. And I know this, she'd give up her life to help one of her children, and even me, if so called upon. But that being said now, that's love, isn't it? And you love those whom you love you're close to, right? But let me ask this here. Would, would I give up my, my life for Keith Dixon? Right? What about Brother Hayes or Tim Hayes? Would I give my life up for him? See, they're up at front. I can pick on them. And the answer is Yes. Absolutely. Because they're my brothers. But if that's not our attitude, then we got a problem, don't we? You see? Now, it's easy to say that, isn't it? Right? It's difficult to do, isn't it? 
But we need to be in the position of doing instead of just saying. To be really meaning what we say that we would do that if called upon. And I know this, those of you who are here, you would gladly do it because you love the Lord. And I'm so thankful for your great love for the Lord. And so we need to be real and realize just how much we need to love one another. I remind us here in John 13, 34 and 35, a new commandment I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples and that you love one another. John 13, 34 and 35. John uses the word love 39 times in the book of 1 John. He uses the word loveth nine times in the same book. And only four of these times, uh, John used the word love to refer to the love of the world. John used the word love as it relates to the love of the brethren 19 times in this book. And the other use of the word refers to either love of God or the love of the Lord. Therefore, half of the use of the word love relates to the love of the brethren. That ought to tell us something, hadn't it? That in this short, little, concise book, John emphasizes over and over and over love for the brethren. And so it ought to be important, hadn't it? If he's talked about it that much. And we didn't recognize just how important it really is. Lastly, can one lose their eternal life? You see, just because you're not recognized that we have eternal life, and just because we recognize that we can know with an absolute knowledge that we have an eternal life, we still need to recognize this, that we can lose our eternal life. Right? We can lose our eternal life. We can become, we can start living in such a way that we no longer are walking in the light, can't we? We can lose our way in life, right? You know, I remember several years ago, uh, I began a business in, uh, in West Plains, Missouri. And uh, we were having quite successful success at the business. It was doing rather well. And uh, the business started taking care of me more than I was taking care of it. I mean, it, it began to control me. And uh, I had my, my, my advertisement up in these big billboards, uh, all coming in every place in town, you know. Uh, you couldn't come into West Plains without seeing my billboard. It's big and bold. And I wanted everybody to see it, you know. And uh, the uh, community, the uh, people in charge, they started uh, uh, wanting me to come to all these big meetings, you know. And I started getting the big head. The boy, I'm somebody, you know. And I'd been preaching full time all my life until that time. Well, when I started preaching at least. Uh, but uh, my mother taught me one of the best lessons I've ever been taught. One day she told me this. She said, John James, now she called me that. Y'all can't, okay? <laughs> but uh, she said, John James, you know, she said, before you got your business, she said, all you ever talked about was the church and the work of the church and people you were studying with and things of that nature. She said, do you know now that all you ever talk about is your business? And I thought, boy, I have lost my priorities. I, I've stepped out of line with the Lord. I realized at that moment I was no longer walking in the light as I ought to be. And I repented. And I made a commitment that I would get back walking in the light. And if that meant selling the business, then the business would be gone. And we sold the business. And I'm so thankful my mother said, you need to get back walking in the light, bud, because you're not walking in the light. And that's not exactly what she, how she said it, but that's what she meant. I understood what she meant. You see, if I don't believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, I cannot have eternal life. If I don't uh, keep on walking in the light, I cannot have eternal life. If I don't come into contact with the blood of Christ, I cannot have eternal life. And if I do not love my brother as I ought to, I cannot have eternal life. Therefore, I can lose my eternal life. And John makes that so crystal clear in the book of John. And I hope that you'll go the next time you have available to you 
Go and read the book of 1 John. It is a great book with great truths that can help us so much in our quest for eternal life. God bless you. Thank you for being here.